All right. So, I mean, who had a who had a good Thanksgiving, right? Best best day of the year besides maybe Christmas. But Thanksgiving, I always feel like we overlook because now Christmas is like gone into September. And so I really, really like to focus on Thanksgiving. Um, you know, we all have good stories from Thanksgiving Day. I like telling mine because, um, you know, Hannah could probably tell you how crazy my Thanksgiving Day is. Uh, we, we do two different meals. Um, we go down to Louisiana, and it's my grandparents' families. And so we only get to see them once a year. And uh, that's really on Thanksgiving, maybe on Christmas, maybe twice a year. And so we do lunch on my mom's side of the family. And there's, to, this year we had 42 people there. My grandfather's one of six siblings, and there's like four generations. And so trying to like play guess who, who belongs to who, who is whose sister and who's, whose daughter or son or father, that's always fun. So it gets a little crazy over there. And then I always feel like we'll have a chance to relax when we go over to dinner at my dad's side of the family because there's only about 10 of us there. So I'm thinking, wow, it's a little bit more laid back. We'll be able to just enjoy the day. Well, this year, being in North Louisiana, um, LSU ended up playing Texas A&M on Thanksgiving night. And um, my dad's side of the family, my grandfather's a big Arkansas fan. And so, you know, he's the naysayer the whole game, talking bad about LSU, which is pretty hilarious because he's, he's hilarious. And then I have an eight-year-old cousin who's a big LSU fan. And, I mean, here I am thinking, all right, time to relax, maybe watch a little football, maybe watch LSU play. This is going to be good. And I can't even hear myself think for three and a half hours. That was a first down, which if you've ever watched a football game with me, that's probably what I sound like. But, and I'm not even eight years old, but it's just a, it's, it's a wonderful day. And I'm so glad that, um, that, that we got to, to share another one this, this past week. But um, today... Today I want to talk about, uh, talk about the grace of God and the love of God. And, and love is a word that I feel gets overused or misconstrued a lot of times. Uh, and today I want to look at, at, the, at the correct form of love that God gives to us through the sacrifice of His Son and the grace that He bestows on us with no merit of our own, none of, none of anything we can do, can, can merit what God does for us every single day, but He still does it anyways because of the selfless, sacrificial love that He has for us. And so, you know, do we really know what the word love means? Do we really know what the Bible says about love? Um, you know, because a lot of people think when, when you're a child and you go to Sunday school and, and you pick up a Bible for the first time or your Sunday school teacher gives you a Bible, you know, they tell you that it's a love story from God, and it is a love story from God. And the, but they, then they go on to tell you that, you know, you begin to think on your own and you begin to think, well, you know what, God probably thinks I'm a pretty good person because I read the Bible. And God loves me because I read the Bible and because I go to church and because I go to Sunday school. And then when you grow up and you start to really read the Bible, you see that the Bible actually says, uh, no, you are dirty, you are sinful, you are awful because you fall short of everything that God laid out before you. But there is that one thing and that one person called Jesus Christ who intercedes for us and is the goodness for us. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And so, the most important theme of the Bible is love. God did write us a love story, and it is this book. It's this library, actually, right? Over 60 books written over a span of over a thousand years, and it's from 30, 40 different authors, people who wrote down these words inspired by the Holy Spirit, Old Testament and New, and it's God's words to us and His way of telling us, I love you. And His pursuit of us is something that I want to talk about today. And there's two major comparisons of God's love that are rampant throughout the Bible. He compares the love of God to, to a husband and a wife and to a father and a son. And, you know, I always like to see... Um, you know, I always like to go down to Louisiana for my, uh, to see my grandparents because both of my mom's parents are still alive and to see them in their uh, advanced stages of life still in love with each other and still loving each other sacrificially and still living for each other, I imagine that that's what God's love is like for us. And then on my dad's side, my grandmother died about 
six years ago. And to see that love that he still has for her at every family gathering, you know, he still says, you know, think about, think about Sammy is her name. You know, I called her Granny. Think about Granny and, and all, of the, all the things that she did and the person that she was. And, and it's so cool to see the love that is there with them as well. And then the other comparison is between a father and a son. And I always like the father-son comparison because you know, obviously I think about my own father, but I also like to see it in a different stage of life when I come to church every Sunday. right? I mean, I get to see Jason be around his two daughters and in their early stages of life and just to see how he has to take full care of them and has to take complete care of them at all times. He and Colleen have to take care of them and basically live for them as well while they are still learning how to um, do life on their own. And so it's amazing to see those examples of love and to think about the fact that that's the kind of love that God has for us when we are dirty, when we are sinful, when we are completely undeserving of the love that He does give to us. And the love of God is split into two parts, right? The Bible split into two parts, and the Bible being split into two parts is very cut and dry. In the Old Testament, you have the laws of God, right? In the book of Deuteronomy itself, there's over 200 laws that are specifically written out. Over 200 laws that are specifically written out for the people of God. And then, in the New Testament, there is the love of God. And the fact that the laws of God have now been superseded by the love of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we're going to talk about the laws of God, and then we're going to talk about the transition of into the love of God and how the Bible is not a set of principles to live by, it's a person to live for. And that makes me very happy, right? Because all of us, all of us have, have fallen into temptation, all of us have sinned, right? Romans 3, 21 through 23. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, that famous verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all fall short, right? Because the thing about the law is there's no grading scale, right? I, I, love, I love grading tests on Friday. I teach U.S. history, and I love grading tests on Friday because I like to see who studied and I like to see who did. And I like when, you know, I tell them that I like when they fail, but there's also a, a little side part to that, because I ask them, the next question I ask is, well, what did you do to prepare? And they say, well, nothing. And I said, okay, there you go, right? You deserve this, right? And we deserve the same thing. If we do not prepare ourselves, we deserve the same exact thing. And if God does not, with God's pursuit of us, we have to still come to the realization that he is trying to save us and he loves us and he loves us beyond all recognition right and it's amazing to see but the thing about God's law is there's no grading scale there's no oh 90 percent you made an A Woo! no you miss one question you get a zero right you miss one question you get a zero in James 2 10 it says forever for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. I gave my kids a test last week on um, different presidential policies that we talked about getting ready for a state test that's the day after tomorrow. And um, their state test, if it was you miss one question, you fail, then I would be out of a job on Wednesday um, because there's nobody, not even me, I don't think, I don't think I could take that 70 question test and get 100 on it. It's really hard and there's a lot of reading on it. They've actually matched it up with the reading part of the ACT. And I just don't think that I could, you know, I'm not a good enough reader. I love to read, not good enough at it. And so if, if all of our tests in life were a miss one question and you fail, then we would all fail and we all fall short. But the thing about it is, is that's where God comes in. If you fail, and you will, everybody has failed, like Romans 3 says. Everybody has failed, but there is also two words that come up a lot in the Bible, and you hear about them a lot. The grace of God and the mercy of God. And grace, definition of grace, getting something you don't deserve 
And mercy is not getting something that you do deserve. Right? The fact that we get salvation, we don't deserve it. That's the grace of God. We deserve hell. We don't get it. That's the mercy of God. And the fact that God displays His grace and mercy upon us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us and became that grace and mercy, that is just always going to be an unbelievable story to me. So, our main passage today is in Romans 8. A little bit of background on the book of Romans. Romans is one of Paul's longer letters, right? And the reason that it's one of Paul's longer letters is because it's his entire doctrinal message to the church of Rome. Paul is unable to get to Rome physically until towards the end of his life. And so he writes his entire doctrinal message, the entire doctrine of salvation and God and Jesus Christ and everything that you read about in the Bible is written about in Romans. And he sends it as a letter to the church in Rome, pretty major city at that point, right, if you know your world history. It's a pretty major city, and the church in Rome was growing and so he wanted to make sure that they were growing in the correct way, growing in the doctrines and the love of God. And so he sends this lengthy letter. And then the chapter we're going to be in is chapter 8. And chapter 8 is talking about freedom from the law. And there is no better person in the Bible, no better author in the Bible to write about freedom from the law than Paul. All right? Paul gives his resume a few times throughout his letters. And he talks about the kind of person that he was. He grew up as a Jew. He grew up in the best tribe. He grew up as a Pharisee. He grew up following the law. And he knew the Scriptures, and he knew the scrolls, and he knew the Torah, and he knew the Old Testament. He knew the prophecies. And he tried to live by them. And then he says, you know what? Even I have fallen short. Even I... The, the Pharisee of all Pharisees has fallen short, right? Because the law is a funny thing. And that brings me to my first point. Point number one, we've got four points today. Point number one is the law is not a bad thing, right? We still live a lot by the Ten Commandments, correct? I mean, we still see them a lot. We still study them a lot, right? That's one of the first things that you learn when you're in Sunday school when you're younger is the Ten Commandments. And the law is not a bad thing, right? Romans, in the chapter before, in the chapter before, Paul writes, What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. The idea that the law gives us our baseline, right? I mean, when Avery and Hadley are growing up, the only way that they'll know not to do something is to do it and then have Jason and Colleen say, We don't do that, right? I think that was my parents' favorite words, right? We don't do that. Well, I just did it. I, mean, I, I didn't say that. That would be bad. But. But the idea that the law is not a bad thing, right? The Old Testament is not a bad thing. Laying out for us what is right, what is wrong, what we should do, what we should not do, some guidelines for us. We're human. We need guidelines, right? We need structure. We need discipline. And God gives us that throughout the entire Old Testament. Law is not a bad thing. In Matthew 5, part of, uh, part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, He talks about the law. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And that last sentence always gets me. He says, for I tell you, unless you exceed the scribes and the Pharisees, you're not going to get in the kingdom of heaven. What he's basically saying is it is impossible to do this. It is impossible. Because the scribes and the Pharisees had pretty much the entire Old Testament. Some of them probably had it memorized. They had read it and studied it and meditated upon it and prayed upon it for their entire lives, and they knew it backwards and forwards, better than any of us probably know the Scriptures today. right? 
But when you look at the life of Jesus, these people are the ones who are supposed to be the example to live by. They're the ones that follow the law. They're the ones that do God's will. They're the ones that are perfect in God's eyes. But who are the ones that Jesus always rebukes whenever it comes to a situation where somebody's doing something wrong? The Pharisees, right? He goes up to the Pharisees and says, you evildoers, right? He, ta- he calls them snakes. He calls them anything negative, right? And, he, and, and those are the people that are supposed to be living by God's law. And, he, and they're the ones that Jesus is saying, you're not doing it right. So what in the world is going on with the law if, if, it's, if it's being followed by the Pharisees and Jesus is still getting on to them for following that law, what is going on? And that brings us to point number two. Right? Number, point number one, the law is not a bad thing, but point number two, the law is not enough. Right? The law is not good enough. And that gets us to the first four verses in Romans 8 this morning. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. You could come up with an entire sermon series on those four verses. I'm not smart enough to do that. Jason probably is. I am not. So we're just going to spend a little bit of time on it. If you'd like to study it, that's awesome. There's a lot of scripture today. I want you, you know, that, that's what we're always aiming for, right? But the first four verses is talking about how the law is not good enough, but there is someone who was good enough to take the place of the law. And so, verse 1, the word therefore is there, right? And there's the first thing they teach you in any sort of religion class or theology class. What's the question you're supposed to ask yourself when you see that word in the Bible? You might know it. What's the therefore, therefore? Right? What's the therefore, therefore? And in Romans 8, 1, Paul is saying therefore, talking about chapters 6 and 7. And if you go back and you read Romans 6 and Romans 7, you see that Paul basically lists out the struggles and the slavery to sin that he has dealt with his entire life and that people deal with their entire lives. The idea that he calls sin, he calls himself a slave to sin. He calls people slaves to sin. We cannot get away from it. And then in Romans 8, he's trying to bridge that gap. Therefore, he says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. The idea that no sin or no trespass that you have throughout your life is overlooked because of the payment of Jesus Christ. It's not because of karma, right? It's not because your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. It's not because you were a good person, but you messed up. No, it's, it, you, know, you did something good, but you're messed up, right? That's what the Bible's trying to say, and that's what Paul's trying to tell us here. But the idea that Christ Jesus makes us good through the sacrifice of the cross. Right? That's where the love and the justice of God intersect is on the cross through those nails. The idea that the judgment of God was passed upon His Son and He was the propitiation for our sins while dying on a cross for us. And that's the unbelievable story of the gospel right there. Right? And then... Verses 2 through 4, the idea that the law is unable, right? He says the law is unable to fulfill the wrath of God or appease the wrath of God. The only thing that could was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus is the supplement to the law. The idea that the law was written thousands of years ago and the idea that Christ Jesus becomes the law for us and follows the law. We could not follow it. He could. He's the only person in history that has been able to do so because he's the son of God, and when he became that sacrifice for us, the law and the new covenant, which we'll talk about in a second, is now what we are responsible for. One of my favorite, well, favorite, it's become my favorite, but not for reasons that you would think. Um, There was a little two-part movie series that became the huge thing in the church a few years ago, uh, there was a movie called The Da Vinci Code, and then there was a movie called Angels and Demons that came out um, a little bit after it. 
And if you just watch those movies for like some of the Christian history and some of the history of the city of Rome, I mean, I love those movies. I'm kind of obsessed with watching like the old churches in Rome and seeing all the stuff. You know, I don't pay attention to like the weird creepy stories that are going on in there and some of the things that they make up Hollywood style but if you actually watch the movie and you listen to some of the things that are said some of the things that are said make a lot of sense and it makes a lot of sense to people outside of the church the idea that you know when you you can't really get a feel for how people feel about the church until you listen to what people say outside the church um, you know and I actually listened to or read something this morning about that Exodus Gods and Kings movie and Ridley Scott, the director of it, about how he feels like he was put in a good spot to do a Bible story because he's actually an agnostic and it gives him a more objective view on the Bible and his ability to make a movie about it. And so that kind of scares me to see what's going to happen actually in the movie. But hopefully, you know, he'll use the Bible as a source. But in the movie Angels and Demons, at the very end of the movie, when everything is, you know, coming to an end and they're wrapping the whole movie up, one of the cardinals of the Catholic Church says to the main character, Tom Hanks, he says in the coolest accent ever, I'm not going to try it, but he said, religion is flawed, but religion is flawed because man is flawed. The idea that as soon as religion steps away and tries to take the words of this and put them into our own human ways, that is what flaws religion. And if you follow the Catholic Church and you follow the, 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 any sort of denomination or any sort of church throughout American history as well as world history, you see that religion's pretty flawed. The idea that we have, we have kind of messed it up, right? The idea that, that people are scared of religion because of the people who are in the religion. The idea, you know, we, we kind of give it a bad name. But... He says religion is flawed because man is flawed. And, there, and there's really no truer statement. The idea that, you know, he's talking to somebody outside the church in Tom Hanks who, you know, says he doesn't really believe in God. And he says, you know, don't, don't be too harsh on religion because basically it's our fault. It's our fault. And, and it's not God's fault. Right? It's definitely not God's fault. And so the idea that, that we flaw religion, the idea it says... Um, it says, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. Right? We messed it up. And that gets us to the third point. When information turns to transformation, right? Information turns to transformation. The idea that the Old Testament is a bunch of information, right? You know, you go through your yearly reading plan on New Year's Day, and the whole reason that most people stop that reading plan is because they get to a book called Leviticus, right? And when you get to Leviticus, you're like, oh, that's really wordy. And then after that, you go into Numbers, and there's some cool stories in Numbers, you know? And then you're like, all right, this is good, right? We're getting into the, into, into the, the, the freedom of the Israelites. And then you get into Deuteronomy, and then you're like, oh, good, more laws. This is fun, right? This, this oh, boy. Right? And then you're like, okay, well, maybe... But then by that point, you know, you, you've messed up your whole yearly reading schedule, right? And so I, th I really do kind of blame <laughs> the Leviticus on the reason that, that and the fact that Genesis is like a big soap opera. But anyways, you, you can read that to do it yourself. But um, Romans 8, 5 through 8, the idea that that information and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ turns into the transformation of us by the Spirit. Uh, it says... In Romans 8, 5 through 8, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The idea, I like the duality of the words, the, the drastic nature of the words and the contrast of the words in there. The idea that the flesh is death, but the spirit is life. And the idea that the death is okay, right, and the, and the spirit is okay. No, it's, it's the flesh is really, really bad, and the spirit is really, really good. And that transformation is to lead us from tolerating sin to despising sin and wanting to flee from it. And I think that's why Paul uses those words and the idea that, you know what, I'm going to be straight up with you. This is death. 
And you are in death right now. But the Spirit brings life, and the Spirit brings all of these wonderful things. And he's trying to basically say, dude, what are you doing? Like, you know, if you don't follow this, then you're crazy. The idea that you're going into death, and you need to come into life. And so it gives us, you know, the idea that, that our corrupted desires, that's the reason that God has to pursue us. Right? The idea that, that, that we are sinful, we are in a sinful nature, and God pursues us, and He pursues our hearts before we can even have a grasp on who God is and what God's love is. And the idea that His pursuit of us is the gracious love that God brings upon us. And uh, you know, I talked a little bit ago about, about a person to live for instead of policies to live by, and I'm so glad that that is the love of God. Um, you know, to use an example, today today is Hannah's birthday, and um, you know I'm really glad she didn't give me a really big list of things to do at like a specific time, because you know she obviously deserves the best, right? And it would be a, a long list of, of things. You know, wake up and you know, hey, happy birthday, right? And then you know, give her flowers when she got to church and all that stuff, right? A long list, because there's no way I would be able to fulfill all the things that she deserves. Right? But I'm so glad she is gracious enough to know that you know, I still love her and I still care about her on her birthday even though I didn't follow some list. Well, that's how God is. God, if He were to give us a list, which He did in the Old Testament, we cannot fulfill that. But He's gracious enough to say, you don't have to. Right? And the only way you can is through Jesus Christ. And so, <clears throat> in Ephesians, it said, But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Then a couple other verses, Galatians 6, 7, and 8, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will, reap, will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Again, just him reiterating the fact that the flesh is death and the Spirit is life. And then Romans 10, 4, it says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The idea that the law has ended. Christ is the end of that law and Christ is the sacrifice for us. And then verse 7 and 8, it talks about how good deeds done outside of the Spirit are done with selfish motives and produced by the flesh. The idea that you cannot live for God outside of the Spirit. Right? The Spirit is the one who leads your life to live for God. And that's always an interesting concept because, you know, when I teach world religions in the spring, the number one question I get is, well, how can they go to hell? They did so many good things. And I said, well, that doesn't matter. And they said, well, what do you mean it doesn't matter? I said, okay, let me, let me pull out a, a laundry list of verses that tell you that that doesn't matter. Right? The idea that what the good deeds that you do are only done through selfish motives unless they're done by the Spirit. And so that Spirit giving life to us is the only way for us to, to really live in the will that God has, has laid before us. And then, finally, number four, right? It, Christ is the answer to the problem of the law, right? The law is not a bad thing, but the law is not good enough. And then that, inf it, that information turns to transformation. And then finally, Christ is the, the answer to that law problem. And it says in verses 9 through 11, it says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. And that always takes me back to uh, Matthew 22 when Christ or Jesus basically gives His answer to why the law is no longer. People ask Jesus, the Pharisees come up and they ask Jesus, they say, which, which commandment is the greatest? I know there's ten of them. Or even if they want to get even more specific. I know there's over 200 of them. But which one is the greatest? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then love your neighbor as yourself. And the idea that you know, that wasn't one of the ones that was specifically written down in the Old Testament. They were like, whoa, 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 that's not in our list. right? They started going through their scrolls. They started saying, that's not it. And he was like, you know what? If you follow these two, 
then you follow the 10, or you follow the 200. Right? If you live for God, and if you live to love others, then all of the other laws and all the other decrees take care of themselves. Because if you love God, guess what? You're not going to build any idols to any other gods. If you love other people, you're not going to murder. If you love other people, you're not going to steal. Right? If you love people, you're going to honor your father and your mother. Those things are going to take care of themselves. And he basically says that in those two commandments. He says, these are the greatest. Love God and love people as yourself. And then, verse 10, it talks about righteousness manifesting itself through control of the Spirit. The idea that we are not able to, but the Spirit is. And then, 2 Corinthians talks about just... I guess feeding that point. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Again, just saying that the, the law is death, the flesh is death, but the Spirit is life. And then, uh, just a couple last things. It, Paul says, you know, he, he repeats himself, just like I do all the time, right? Repetition is a powerful tool that Paul uses. And he's basically just trying to reiterate points. Just saying, you know what, this is important. You need to hear it again. And he talks about God raising Christ Jesus from the dead. And that's what gives you life. And that's how it does. And, blah, blah, blah. and you're just like, okay, I can't even follow it because it's like going in circles. right? But he's trying to bring up the qualifications of the Trinity. He talks about the Father. He talks about the Son. And he talks about the Holy Spirit all in those couple verses right there in Romans 8. And those qualifications of the Trinity are brought up. And what he's basically saying in a human text, in the, in the Kyle Nichols form of, of Romans 8, he basically says, hey, weirdo, if he can do this, he can do this, right? You know, we read it and we say, you know what? Oh, man, God must be pretty powerful. If he can raise a dude from the dead, then he can transform our pitiful little lives, right? And so that's an awesome, awesome verse for, for me to read because, you know, it's just like, okay, you know, God, remind me who you are. Wow, yeah, you're, you're right. You've done what no other human or God has been able to do, and thank you for that. And so, you know, just kind of wrapping things up with a few more verses from throughout uh, Paul's writings. The idea that in Colossians 3, it says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is in your life appears, then you will also will appear with Him in glory. And in Galatians 3 it says, But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Talking about again the crucifixion and the idea that He became the law for us. It says, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. That's the Gospel. Receive the Spirit through faith because of Jesus' death on a tree. I mean, that's the New Testament in three verses right there. And then, finally, Colossians 2. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the, un and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And again, I mean, that just, I, you, you probably would have preferred this, but I could have read those two verses and we could have been done. But the idea that, you know, we cannot follow the law. And because we cannot follow the law, Christ had to undergo the ultimate sacrifice, which is to die for you, right? To die because of us. But he also died for us, you know? Uh, in that world religions class, I always show the passion of the Christ, and they say, they say, man, that must have hurt. And I said, yeah, I'm sure it did. But, you know what, you know who did that to him? You. And they're like, well, he lived 2,000 years ago. I said, I don't care. He died for every sin, past, present, and future. And the idea that he became that sacrifice and the law for us is just an unbelievable statement of his love and the grace that he has for us because we are so, so, so undeserving of it but he still gives us that love and that grace because he is a loving God and he is a just God and he is a faithful God that we are able to trust in him in everything that we do let's pray